All right, I see that Pam, uh, Pamela Porter has joined us uh, from the state staff and we've started recording. So I will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And can someone tell me just quickly if you can see uh, the first slide of my PowerPoint, establishing a quality program? Yes, yes. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, well, um, my name is Meredith Zimmerly and you guys heard from me yesterday uh, with the membership committee. Um, and today I'm gonna talk to you from a different side and that is the fact that I've been where you are. <laughs> uh, just, uh, oh my goodness, I'm starting my 10th, um, my 10th academic year this fall um, in a BMITE program. And it seems like time has really flown by. Um, I am at Chelsea High School which is in the Northeast corner of the state. Uh, we are halfway, roughly halfway between Tulsa and Joplin, Missouri. Um, this past year, um, our middle school program became an unfunded BMITE program. So that's kind of changing up a little bit of some of the things that I'm gonna get to teach this fall. Um, <laughs> with, with requirements and everything, it's still kind of up in the air as to what my schedule is going to look like, even though school starts in three weeks. Um, but the plan is that I will be teaching basically six different preps um, for the high school level. So we're starting fundamentals of technology with the eighth graders. I will have one fundamentals of technology class for students who either didn't pass or they moved in and didn't have fundamentals of technology before, um, before coming to Chelsea. Uh, I will also have desktop publishing. I think with a lot of a lot of with what you guys teach, I can I can help you out with a few things. But we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. So establishing a quality be my program, it does take some work. You do have to know where your program has been. You have to have a plan um, of where you want your program to be, and just keep in mind that your program is always about your students and their success. Um, I think. Sometimes where folks struggle, they tend to say, oh, what can I do? What, what can I get out of this? You've got to look at it. It's both. It's not just you. It's also your students. And by where the program has been, I'll tell you a little bit about what I experienced. Um, you'll know that every program is different. Some of them are very messy. Some of them, uh, when you inherit it, it's really great. Um, if you are just walking into your BMITE program this fall, you know, expect anything. For those of you who maybe came into it last year and now you're after New Teacher Academy and you're doing New Teacher Academy after your first year, bless your heart. I can imagine starting my first year in the program with a pandemic and you, you know what I mean about some of them are good and some of them are messy. So let me tell you a little bit about my first day. Um, it was Monday, October 28th, 2012. It was my very first teaching position. I had been given the job the previous Thursday. Um, at that point in the year, I was already the third teacher, the fourth teacher in seven years. When I walked in, I had no class roster, no school email, no grade book. I didn't have a teacher computer. I became the teacher two weeks before our second parent teacher conference of the year. Um, the substitute teacher that I had taken over for, she'd been there for a little over a month. She had zero discipline. Um, the computer teacher, the computer for the teacher, it had crashed. And I have quotes around that because there's more to this story, but I don't want to give all of it away just yet. I had no inventory, had no idea what I was supposed to have. I had basically one book. I spent the previous weekend uh, cleaning my classroom until four o'clock in the morning. I had a syllabus, I had a one week plan. It was literally just flying. It was all that I was doing. It was, I was on a, I felt like I was on a sinking ship, um, but at least I had a one week plan. I had a life preserver, but best of all, that's right, it gets better. This was the wallpaper on all 24 computers in the classroom. Now, definitely not with the circle. I put the circle there to protect the individual's identity, 
Um, but this was the previous computer teacher. She actually had got arrested on September 14th for embezzling $143,000 from her previous school district. She left her previous school district uh, while she was under investigation. My school district had no idea that she was even under investigation for embezzlement. She was there for, she was at Chelsea for a full year. Um, and this is literally my superintendent in my, <laughs> in my job interview. He said, you know, I'll just tell you what happened because it's public knowledge. It's, it, it was in the paper. He's like, so she took a day off from work. She took a professional day or a personal day. I'm sorry. She took a personal day on a Friday. He's like, on Saturday, I'm sitting at my, t I, my kitchen table. I'm reading the Tulsa world. And I see her picture and that she had been arrested for embezzlement. Uh, she'd actually went and turned herself in. So I had a, some, a student who um, had also seen it and decided that that would be the wallpaper on all 24 computers in the room. So what I'm saying is, hey, you know what? Even after all of that, 10 academic years later, I'm still here. <laughs> um, you know, regardless of the situation, go in with an open mind, make it your own, you know, whatever happened with the previous teacher, you may have had a, had a bad experience. <laughs> I had students um, make a lot of jokes for, for three years. And once those kids graduated, um, those jokes stopped, thank goodness. You're gonna have some moments of surprise. You are gonna be tested repeatedly. You are gonna feel overwhelmed and it's okay. And just know that you are not alone. You have an amazing career tech division who will do anything for you. Utilize their knowledge. Get a hold of them. Um, if you have a mentor teacher, by all means, talk to that person. Ask some questions. Don't ever feel like you are burdening them. We're here to help. That's why we agreed to be mentor teachers. That's why we do what we do. We're here to help. So. Getting you prepared for the new school year. For some of you, I don't know if um, anyone starts the first day of August. Um, I think Oklahoma City usually does. My school starts on the 11th. So I would assume that most of you guys either start around the same time as my school or maybe a week later. Um, a huge key to your success is going to be getting organized. Um, some of you may know this already, some of you may not. I'm just gonna go over it anyway. Make an appointment, meet with your principal as soon as possible. Get your school handbook, your school calendar, your classroom keys, know where your equipment storage is. If there are any special keys for that, get those. Know the hours that you're gonna be able to access your classroom. Um, especially if you weren't giving a master key to the building, uh, that's gonna be really important. You may be limited on the time frame in which you can get into your room. Make an appointment with your district IT director. Know what your computer login information is. Get your gradebook and email set up. Anything that they have control of for combinations or keys to any technology storage. And discuss your administrator rights to the computers in your classroom. It's going to be super important that if you need to grant access to a student to download an Adobe product or um, if you need to be the one that updates land school or anything like that, know what your IT department is going to allow you to do. My IT director and our assistant to the IT director has given me some, over the years, some really great access um, to letting me kind of control some of the things um, as far as administrator um, tasks in my classroom uh, that they don't allow for other folks in the district. So, um, that's, that's really a, a good thing. If you can establish that kind of relationship and you can kind of take care of your own classroom, sometimes that's really a, a good thing and just call them in for the major stuff. Uh, make an appointment with your special education department as soon as possible. Get copies of any IEPs for your students that are gonna be uh, receiving special education services and know if you have any students with any kind of physical impairments where you will need to accommodate that student, like creating a special workstation, work area, so that student can um, work with the other, with the rest of the class. Um, remember that IEPs are confidential. My special education department, they eventually give them to you. It never hurts to make the initial contact. Um, know 
what your IEP students accommodations are and modifications that need to be done for your content area. So for example, in my district, we are 26% special education and the state average is 11%. Um, so I have roughly one in four, at least one in four of every student in my class is going to have some kind of an accommodation, um, an IEP accommodation. So um, just a from personal experience, none of the IEPs that were given to me during my teaching experience have ever had any kind of accommodations or modifications geared toward computer technology education. So sometimes you may have to um, talk to your special education department and see if there are any students with more severe um, needs or more serious needs uh, and kind of make your own accommodation or modification for them. Um, and I'll have a little cheat sheet that I'm going to talk to you guys about in a little while. So inventory, I can't stress the importance enough that if you are given an inventory list, make your own inventory of your classroom. Uh, the inventory, <laughs> when I started, the district refused to give me an inventory. They asked me to make an inventory, basically given the circumstances of what happened with the previous teacher. They wanted, they had an inventory of what she said was in the classroom. They wanted me to go in independently and say, hey, this is what I've got um, so that they could see if there was anything missing from, from my classroom. And in fact, there was. Uh, she had actually taken eight iPads from the iPad cart and given them away as Christmas gifts to her family. And she was asked to give all of that back. Uh, and we did, we got them all back, thank goodness. But um, that was just the thing that we knew of. We, there were some empty boxes that I kind of have suspicion that there may have been some cameras that were missing as well. Um, but knowing what you have as far as your computers, printers, textbooks, software, any supplies, um, and knowing what supplies like paper and ink, is your district gonna supply that? Or is that something that you need to supply? Knowing what you have, that's gonna help you figure out how to spend your CTE incentive money. You don't wanna spend all of it right up at the beginning. You do want to save a little bit for those projects like, oh man, I really want to do this. Let's make sure I've got the money to do it. But um, here at the beginning, just get some things purchased that um, you know that you're going to need. If you don't want to spend all the money on paper, if you're planning on using a lot of paper, um, have the students bring in some reams of paper for bonus points. Make it worth their while and then you won't have to buy paper for the rest of the year, which is, can be a huge savings. So um, how to do your inventory? I used an Excel file in the past and it disappeared. I now use Google Drive and there is a sample on CTU in an, as an Excel file so that you can see how um, I, I use mine or how I created mine. Um, just a little side note, some districts may be really strict on the inventory forms that you use. Just talk to them and make sure that you can get everything that's in your classroom. Um, because you're going to have some things that not everybody else is going to have. Make sure that you can get all of that fit onto your inventory and onto your sheet, or if they'll let you add pages or even you know, supplement somehow. Your program handbook and your course syllabus. So you need to have this ready to go for your first day of school. And they're not the same thing. Uh, your program handbook, it is a special document contains all the information about your program in general. So this would be something that you would give to every student regardless of what class they're in. So this fall I'm teaching six different classes, but all six of those classes will get the program handbook. The syllabus is where I deviate my information. So um, it's going to include your rules, your procedures, your grading policies, certification expectations, your internet use policy, um, just all of that kind of stuff, that generic thing that every class is going to have to abide by in your room. For your syllabus, go on to CTU. Um, our, di our division is amazing. Like other divisions, my facts teacher and my ag teachers are like, wait a second, we don't have this for us. We have to make our own syllabi. Our division has made syllabi for us. And all we have to do is edit it just a little bit to fit the needs of our program. So um, that's gonna be the course codes, OLAP approval, any specific course objectives, your main instructional materials, all of that kind of stuff, 
I added my personal contact, not my personal contact information, my teacher contact information um, with my school email, the school phone number. I put my supply list on there um, with the suggested textbooks on there. I only put the textbook that I have. I don't have all of the suggested ones. So like I said, you can delete some things off of it, um, but there are some specific ones that you need to keep, especially those course codes and OLAP approval. Because if you have any student, oh, I'm sorry, if you have any student who is um, going for Oklahoma Promise, there are certain courses that will count for the computer courses for Oklahoma Promise. You have to make sure that you have that on there so that they know that they're in the correct class. Um, and so that your enrollment folks also know that those students are going into classes that count for OLAP credit. So planning your year. Um, I use binders and a master calendar. Why do I use binders? Because guys, you guys are gonna have so much paperwork. I hate to break that to you, but you will. Um, and for the things that you need to keep track of for when you do your five-year evaluation, it is super important that you become a paperwork hoarder. <laughs> I know that sounds really bad, but um, it's, it's really, really important. I can't stress that enough. Um, your binder content, so for your main binder, it should be everything that you would need. It's a grab and go if necessary. And in a COVID-19 world, consider making a digital binder and have it backed up to several different locations. Uh, so my end binders, I have a teacher binder, a financials binder, a VPA binder, and a substitute binder. So my teacher binder, I keep my school calendar, which last year changed about four different times. So I changed it out every time. My BPA calendar, my master planning calendar, um, any eligibility lists, if those are printed, I stopped, uh, we stopped getting printed copies when my new principal took over, which was awesome. I could just leave them in my email in a folder. Um, our school handbook, any IEP documentation, any medical precautions for any students, emergency procedures, so fire, tornado, intruder, uh, your program handbook, you want a copy of that, all of the syllabi for your courses, your class rosters, any lesson plans for your current unit, your course crosswalks, your certification exam information. If your district requires you to keep a paper copy of your grade book, have that backed up too. Um, and of course, your substitute requisition forms. And I keep those tabbed out. And for my financials binder, the four, the big ones that you guys are going to end up needing um, right now, I would say the big two is going to be for your 412 expenditures, which is your program assistance funds and your BPA expenditures. Um, if you get to write purchase orders for your Carl Perkins funding for your district, keep a tab for that. And if you are awarded a lottery grant in the future, um, make sure that you keep a tab for that as well. Me personally, I have, um, let's see, 412 BPA, Carl Perkins, lottery grant. I run the uh, home side football concession stand. I'm a class sponsor. I co-sponsor National Technical Honor Society. So my binder is pretty big <laughs> and I have to keep financials for all of that, not only for the school, but when you do your five-year evaluation, you're going to need to show your 412 expenditures, your BPA, lottery grants, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there will be things that you may need to pull from that. So make sure you keep copies of your purchase orders, any receipts and invoices, make copies of those, stick them in there with your purchase order, um, any school financial statements. So we get monthly financial statements. Anytime we make a deposit into our accounts, um, we also get a receipt back from our finance guy that says, hey, this is a copy of who you wrote receipts to, and this has been deposited into your account. It just keeps things really simple, but put all of your financial stuff together. And your BPA binder, I keep it separate from everything else, one, because it can get fairly large, and two, I want it to be something that my officer team can also look at without looking at anybody else's information. I need to keep all the other students private um, so that my officer team only sees what they need to see for the BPA chapter. And that will be a master record of all of your stuff for the year. So some of the things that I put in there, um, calendars, 
I add a copy of the school calendar because like I said, my officer team will take a look at it. My state BPA calendar and our program of work for the year. Our membership information. I print out a membership list. I have an officer list. We have locker numbers in case somebody needs to go just stick a little note on somebody's locker so they can see it between classes. They can do that. And then also participation tracking. You know, who worked concession stand, uh, which is a fundraiser we, that we do for BPA. Who, um, who helped with the talent show? Who went to pro sports career day? Who served on a committee? Things like that. Meetings, sign-in sheets, agendas, and our meeting minutes. We have all of those in there, in that tab. Fundraisers, um, who, what the fundraiser was, what we did as a fundraiser. Um, tracking of who participated, that helps make sure that we get all of the money back that we were supposed to and the kids get credit as they should. Program of work, um, I have a separate one for that. That's going to be our month to month breakdown. We'll have activities, our volunteer work, keep more of like copies of flyers um, that we created for those activities, uh, results of it, things like that. That's kind of a, can be your reporter job in taking care of some of that. Contests, any contest information guidelines, our conduct agreements, have your students sign those and permission slips. Uh, keep all of that in that tab. And then torch awards, I have a, I do a printout of the handbook and I do some tracking to see which ones of my, who of my students are um, participating in torch awards, just kind of, you know, quick at a glance if I can't um, quickly get logged into the system to take a look. And then my substitute binder. This is your resource for your substitute. Super important that you do this. Every, not trying to pat my own back here, but every substitute I've had has told me, we love substituting for you because you are organized. You have a binder. Everything we need is in that binder. We don't have to search your desk for it. And I don't like people searching my desk. So that's why I have a binder. Um, that should contain your general instructions and expectations for the substitute in your classroom. It should be complete and kept up to date. You need to make sure that you have current class rosters, a seating chart, your lesson plan, and an emergency lesson plan. I'm gonna be honest with you, I rarely, rarely use the emergency lesson plan simply because I have everything on Google Classroom. I expect my students to be doing the work while I'm gone. Um, and the activities that I choose have, there are times I've created videos and I've posted those instructional videos. And also the activities that I choose are pretty self-explanatory. So when I have students at home who um, need to make up work, if they can use, if they can do that from their home device, they can, they can do it. Uh, which worked out really good during COVID. I had several students, I would say just as many who couldn't do it as those who could, depending on their device. Uh, who were quarantined this past year, and that helped a lot. It kept a lot of kids from, uh, from getting super far behind and having, um, having all of that posted there. So make sure you keep all of that in your substitute writer. So contents. Um, mine has a letter to the substitute, just kind of brief expectations for how I expect them to not go through my desk or rearrange anything. Stuff's there for a reason. Leave it alone. Um, bell schedule, emergency procedures for fire, tornado, and intruder, basic classroom information, my program handbook, the school handbook. If they need to consult anything, they have that there as a resource for them, whether they look at it or not, it's there. Um, an hour by hour breakdown of basically my schedule for the day. Um, the guest computer login, do not ever give a substitute your login to your computer. The lesson plans, my class rosters. If I have a student that has medical precautions, I've had two students with seizure conditions and a student with um, some very severe uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, they were trying to working on getting it controlled. And I say uncontrolled because he could go up or down at any moment. Um, so I had to make sure that in medical precautions, I had information on who need, like the school nurse's phone number, um, who needed to be contacted in the event that one of those students had an episode while I had a substitute. Blank attendance sheets so that the substitute could write down who was absent for the day, 
blank behavior reports so that they could tell me how each class behaved. And then um, any emergency lesson plan for any kind of unplanned absence that I absolutely did not see coming. Um, it's usually something fairly simple. The master calendar. All right, so my master calendar is the place where I have everything that comes together. It's my school calendar, it's my BPA calendar, it's my career tech events. Um, when I'm working as a, a BMI officer, any kind of reporting dates, school sporting events. Uh, if we have things where kids are gonna miss, I've had this past year, for example, um, I've had days where in a class of 20, I had five kids and we were getting ready to start something new. So I changed directions. That group of students did something, worked on a project with me, and then we started the next day. So kind of knowing what's going on, making sure you stay in the loop is going to be very important. Um, any end of instruction or ACT testing dates, you as a computer teacher, if there's anything um, that is computer based, you may end up losing your lab for a day or two. Uh, one of the things that was great about my district is with COVID, the, <laughs> the good thing that came from COVID is we are now a one to one district. So the students can take their exams on their Chromebooks and I do not lose my classroom, which has been a was a blessing in disguise, sort of. Um, school board meetings and anything else that you need to have on there. And there is an example of that calendar on the CTU. So at the end of the year, um, every year at the end of the year, I place everything from my binders into a folder and I put it in a record box. All of my BPA stuff, my financials, my teacher binder, and a printout of my certification testing results or, or transcripts, whatever your certification uh, testing program calls it. I make sure that is all there. I keep digital copies of some of it as well. But like I said, my inventory disappeared. So paper copies help too. Your first weeks of school. Use your quiet time before all the other teachers report. You know, after summer conference is over with, as soon as you get back, go to your classroom. Get your classroom 100% ready. Do not wait for those professional development days and those meetings you're not gonna have enough time. Have all of your decorating complete, your bulletin boards, in all honesty, get your handbooks completed and printed, get your syllabi completed and printed, you're ready to rock and roll. Um, give those students the impression that you know what you're doing, even if you feel like you do not, because that's a really good thing for you um, going into a new program or if you're a new teacher, make them, make them think you know what you're doing. That gives you the leg up and um, you'll feel like you've got more control in the long run of what's going on in your classroom. Know your school's copy machine policy. My school updates it every year. Uh, for several years, we were limited to 25 copies a week. Um, it doesn't work for some of us when we need handouts. Um, then it got up to 50. And then the limit got taken off this past year. So that was kind of awesome. Before all the, like I said, before all other teachers arrive, make sure you make copies of your program handbook and your syllabus. If you have a centralized location for copying, like a school copy shop, get in there and get that stuff done early before everybody reports or they're gonna get crazy busy. We actually one year had a kindergarten teacher that snuck into the school copy shop and made 5,000 copies before school started. That was a lot of copies. I have no idea what all of they made, but that was one of the reasons for, for some of the limits and making sure that we had a centralized, well-stocked location to make copies for stuff. Um, your first two weeks of school, those are definitely the most critical. It sets the tone for the rest of your school year. That's why I said, even if you feel like you are not prepared, make sure that during those first two weeks, you make the kids think that you're prepared. Um, Cause that's good. Really, it will, it'll set the pace. One thing, one book that I have kept since college uh, and I actually have two copies of it. I have one at home and I have one in my classroom 
It's called The First Day of, of School. It's by Harry Wong. And it's really, it's a go-to resource. It is awesome. Um, and I, I seriously, I use it every year. I go back over it. I refresh my mind, you know, try to come up with some new ideas, things like that. But it really kind of gets me back into the mode of the beginning of school. So um, if you haven't gotten a copy of that, or if you don't have a copy of it, put that on your shopping list. It is a must have. On your first day um, of school, make your introductions and do, introduce your program handbook and um, also your course syllabus. Have some kind of icebreaker activity. Make sure that you are firm, fair, and consistent. If someone breaks the rules, be firm, fair, and consistent with it. Don't be lenient because that right there in that first two weeks, they're thinking that you are going to be just an easy pushover. Don't threaten to punish, just punish them. Address those unacceptable behaviors very early in the course. Prove that there are consequences for inappropriate actions. Um, once, once they see that they're not going to get away with stuff, you know, you can always lighten up later in the year. You can't lighten up and then get strict. It just, it doesn't work. Before you start school, have your first two weeks planned completely. Um, talk to your district. Make sure you know if there's any kind of assembly, class meetings, organization meetings, what pep rallies are going on, you know, depending on when football season gets started for you guys student government elections, all of that kind of stuff, know what's going on. My school is going to have a hypnotist the first day of school. Um, <laughs> and then we'll have class meetings with each one of the classes. So my first day is going to be basically uh, meeting my new class because I was senior class sponsor this year. I'm starting back over with freshmen this year, um, getting to know my freshmen, just getting organized um, with some different things. It's the first day is going to be a little crazy. I'm hoping my second day is going to be just a little bit more back to normal. Have some student information sheets. Uh, there are some things that you'll need to keep track of reporting wise of your students. I do have a sample of that in my CTU stuff that I'm giving you guys. Um, but you're going to want to be able to, to get a hold of folks. And you can either keep paper copies or you could do this as like a Google form, something like that. Keep it digital. Um, safety curriculum. I usually do my safety curriculum the second week of school. Uh, before we get started in with anything else, we take care of that. Uh, my first week is handbook, syllabus, handbook quiz, and we make sure all of the kids' logins work for their student computers. They can get on the district Wi-Fi, um, that they have access to their email, any and all of that stuff. We make sure that all of that we sign up for um, any accounts that they're going to use through the year, we just get that taken care of right there at the beginning. And when I say signing up for accounts, I have a username and password hint index card. So each student, they will put their name and their hour at the top of the card. Uh, they'll use their email address and password hint. And I, I tell them, you know, put your actual address down, put your actual username down. But what you'll need to do is have a password hint. I don't want your password, but it needs to be a hint that's good enough for you to say, oh yeah, that's what my password is. They don't have to sign up for Gmail anymore, which is awesome. My district issues them a Gmail email address, but they still need to, still need to do Pinterest, OneDrive, Daigo, Tinkercad, Powtoon, Weebly. You know, that's just some examples of some of the things that I have students sign up for. And I should say Adobe IDs as well, because I have named user licenses for Creative Cloud. Um, so those are all things I have them do. I have a little pouch on my desk organized by hour. And the kids, we have them, each one of their cards is in their hour. So if a student forgets what their username or password is, instead of us having to go through a 20, 30 minute process, trying to get them back online because, you know, it's not like a high school student would ever intentionally have issues getting signed up to try to get out of doing work. We can pull out that card here, try this. If it doesn't work, then we'll go through the mess. If it does work, then we continue on. Um, 
and it's worked out really good. I've had kids who have had to have some of these accounts for other classes and they'll actually come into my classroom and say, hey, Mrs. Emerly, can I take a look at my index card? I need it for English. Sure, you go right ahead and do that. Um, for during COVID, I created a digital version of this. So for, for the initial sign up at the beginning of school, I would have them do a paper copy. Uh, that's my plan this year. They're gonna do have the actual physical card that they will keep in the, the little plastic envelope on my desk. And then they're also going to transfer that to their digital copy. So if they need it at home, they'll have access to it in their Google Drive. So rules and procedures. Um, a lot of folks get rules and procedures kind of mixed up. I'm gonna do just a little bit of a um, distinction between the two. So your rules, those are gonna define the parameters of what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior in your classroom. Rules are not procedures. Procedures are the steps of how your classroom is going to function its structure. So maybe it is, um, you know, hey, your bell work is to come into class, log on to your computer, open up your Google Classroom, get your, um, maybe you get Photoshop open or you get Word, Excel, PowerPoint open, whatever it is that we're working with, and you be ready to go. Because for some of my computers, it takes five minutes <laughs> to get that up and going. Like I look at, um, you know, it's just the procedure is this is what you're going to do. This is steps you do it. You turn your work into Google Classroom or Edmodo or whatever LMS that you're gonna be using. So rules, acceptable and unacceptable behavior, procedures, how your classroom functions. So advice from experts on creating rules, they say no more than five, make sure that you state them in a positive tone and make sure you post your consequences for breaking those rules. My advice, I have two general rules and five specific ones. Um, you know, treat each other with respect, treat all of the equipment with respect. I state the rules in a positive tone. You know, I say, hey, you know, you wouldn't want somebody, when I explain it, I say, you wouldn't want someone to um, mistreat your stuff that you worked hard for. Don't mistreat this, okay? I would rather spend our program assistance funds getting you know, more stuff for us to work with than having to replace the things that someone destroyed. And the students have been very, very um, receptive of that. They really have. Explain your reasoning. That's what I mean. Explain your reasoning for uh, the rules at the beginning of the school year. Outline those consequences in your student handbook. Um, so some example rules could be Cell phones, iPods, headphones, and other personal electronic devices are not allowed in the classroom without teacher permission. I have literally had students say, hey, Mrs. Simmerly, can I pull out my cell phone to use the calculator? And I tell them, no, I know you're wanting to go to Snapchat. You have a calculator on your computer. Use that. You know, what time is it? Can I look at my phone to look at the time? No, you have a clock on the corner of your computer screen, and you also have one on the wall. Um, Food and drink are not allowed in the computer lab. You know, that's just a basic you know, preventing the mess. And then treat all classroom guests with respect at all times. So example procedures would be take care of break business before entering the classroom. Upon entering the classroom, log into your online classroom, begin the posted assignment. And then definitely after this year, clean and disinfect your workstation at the end of each class each day. So at the end of my handbook, I have a student and parent agreement form. I have the students take that home. They're supposed to look over everything. They return it to me and it's 100 points, not bonus points. It's, an, it's their first grade in the class. And then their second grade in the class is a classroom expectations quiz. It is worth 100 points. I give it at the beginning of the fall semester and the beginning of the spring semester as a refresher to the students who are in there. And for the students who have joined since the beginning of the fall semester, um, they will get a little bit of information about the classroom rules and expectations as well. And I keep both copies on file. If I have any kind of um, major breaking of rules, I have proof that they knew better. And uh, in 
the years of teaching I've had, I've only had to use that twice in a, in two fairly serious situations. And actually one of them was this past year. Um, I had a student who was skipping my class. She had missed a total of 26 assignments in my fundamentals of technology class. And my school district at the time was very adamant about, okay, we need to help students out. COVID has been rough on everybody. Students with individual quarantines um, have had a hard time. We're not putting zeros in. We're going to give it, <laughs> we're going to give them the, all the time they need um, before we really start putting those zeros in. And I had put some zeros in for some earlier work. Um, but she had missed a lot of work from March and April. Um, she'd be there early in the day and then she was gone in the afternoon. Well, then all of a sudden, her work starts getting turned in. Um, in fact, I have my Google Classroom notifications come to my phone and my watch, my, my Apple watch. And anytime I get notifications, anytime there is a, there's late work turned in. And all of a sudden I'm getting late work in from her just, you know, every about 20 seconds, I'm getting another notification. I'm like, what's going on here? Did she just do all of this work? And um, you just not turn it in. And I, I look, I was in the office getting some purchase orders and my classroom's right across the hall from the office. And I look through the window into my classroom and she's not sitting at her chair. I can see her chair playing. She's not there, but her work is still being turned in. So I went back in my classroom. And as I'm walking through my classroom, I'm still getting notifications. I go to my desk. I pull up my land school. And um, I see that, yeah, it's definitely not coming from her. Um, it's definitely not coming from her computer. So I go to Google Classroom. I open up one of the assignments. I download it and on the backstage view in Microsoft Office, you can see who the person was who created it and the last person to edit. And it was one of our foreign exchange students. This, this young lady had actually duped one of our foreign exchange students into submitting 26 assignments for her. And the foreign exchange student said, well, I didn't know that I was doing anything wrong. And so I had to pull out my classroom expectations quiz and say, hey, yes, you did. Because you got, you got that question correct twice. Giving another student work is considered cheating and that's an automatic zero. So um, she explained and her host family also explained, I worked with her a little bit on that. Um, she explained that when in her home country, sharing homework is allowed among the students, they view cheating as quizzes and exams, which, you know, as <laughs> that's a very different perspective to me, but she seemed concerned enough about it that I gave her a major alternative assignment um, in lieu of her getting zeros on all of that work and um, for her role in the process. The student who received the work, she got zeros. Um, and that was a, that was a no exception. She knew better. She really did. She, there was no excuse for what she did. She knew better um, that asking the foreign exchange student who honestly did not understand completely what our policy was. Um, yeah, she knew she got zeros. So hall passes, um, some of my procedures, I have a hall pass. I created what looks like a time card. I created it in Publisher and it is also on CTU in both Publisher and PDF formats. And I have an actual time clock. So what I do is I give students two hall passes a week and they have to have their time card with them. If they, uh, they have to ask permission of course to go, punch their time card, they can go to the restroom, go to the locker, what they need to do, come back. They punch their card that they came back in. If they do not use a hall pass, they get one bonus point for each week. They do not use a hall pass for up to a total of 10 bonus points each nine week period. I encourage them to take care of any break business uh, before class, including bringing all the required items. 
Um, bell work. If you have any bell work, that's going to be a procedure. The bell work from my class is coming in and getting your computer started, being ready to go when the bell rings. And then in ending a class, they need to make sure that they have um, all their assignments turned in. They need to restart the computers. Um, and they also need to push their chairs in. Just maintaining a organized and clean workspace. So a little bit of advice regarding classroom discipline. It's important to be honest with your students. Not cruel, not crude, but just honest. Don't be afraid of them. You are the adult in the room. They do not need friends. They need structure and adult mentorship. And um, I don't know, you know, for some of the backgrounds, the districts that you guys come from, my district um, is a impoverished community. And we have kids who do not have structure and adult mentorship at home. And they crave that. They need that. And that's one of the things that you can do if, if you're in that kind of situation. Make sure that you're giving them that structure and that adult mentorship that they need. Be positive. Be encouraging of your students. Say please and thank you. Go to their after school activities and make sure that they see that you're there. You know, and saying please and thank you. There's a lot of times that, you know, especially in my school with some of the situations that my kids have come from. Um, your positive attitude could be the only positive attitude that they have all day. Like school is their sanctuary away from what they have to go home and live in. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to baby them, but we can make school a pleasant place for them to be where they actually want to come to school. Um, and most of all, with a high school student, they just want to be adults. You know, we should refrain from using elementary level consequences and procedures. Treat them with respect. I tell them, you treat me with respect, I'm going to treat you with respect. We have mutual respect. And it works. It really does work. And the students who don't get that, I use those rules and the consequences to get that point across to them very quickly. That as long as you show respect, I'm going to respect you. If you disrespect me, you're going to go have a conversation with the principal. Uh, your seating chart, allow your students to sit where they want for the first two weeks, learn their habits and who their friends are, then create a seating chart based on what you've learned. Um, this past year, I had four, gen five, I had five young men who sat together um, that drove me insane during the first two weeks, but that's my policy. Even if it drives me nuts, first two weeks. I want to see what they do. If they can't follow my rules, then I separate them. Not enough corners in that classroom for those five. Um, and some other situations happened. And I ended up with only having three of them left in my class after their own personal home life situations. But um, change your seating chart. You know, if you see that something's not working, change it. Um, update it every nine week period. And honestly, I've had some classes where the kids know what my policy is, that I will change their seating chart, and they make sure if they want to sit next to their friends, they're going to do their work, and they are not going to um, just kind of dilly-dally around. They're going to get their work done. You know, I tell them that my classroom is really no different than any real-life work situation. As long as you work, you know, you can visit while you work, but you don't need to visit instead of work. You know, that's going to get you fired in the real world. That's going to get you zeros in the classroom because you're not getting your work done. So using a LMS, learning management system. So what is it? It's a learning management system. It's an online classroom and it's a central location for your class assignments. Um, any files that you need students to access from any device with an internet connection. So why use it? Um, in post-COVID world, I think pretty much every school district is using some form of an online classroom. Um, you may have gotten a lot of experience with this this past year. And if you've had experiences with it in the past, believe you me, because you're the computer teacher, you're going to have a lot of teachers coming to you wanting advice and wanting help. Um, it's really great for absent students. They can check their missed work. 
One thing that I have really loved about it is it eliminates that, hey, you lost my homework, teacher, um, excuse. It really does. Um, our algebra teacher, we had told her for years, hey, you need to use a, just incorporate some kind of a digital classroom or an online classroom for your assignments. You know, have the kids take a picture of their homework and upload it. Um, because there was a lot of them, you know, that had accused her of losing her, losing their work. And because of the COVID world, that happened this year. And though <laughs> she was amazed at how, how it eliminated the whole, hey, you lost my homework. You know, the kids were then 100%, 100% responsible for getting that work in. And if it wasn't there, it wasn't done. That's it, the end. Um, reduces cheating. It gives you the ability as a computer teacher, you know, if you're teaching any kind of Microsoft Office stuff in backstage view, you can see who created and who edited. So the reduction of cheating, oh yeah, that, that was a good thing. And it helps you catch those cheaters as well when you need to. Um, and it prepares the student for distant learning. You know, any kind of situation, if you've got students who are not um, very well versed with it, if they were just using packets for, for COVID, you doing that in your classroom while we are present face-to-face -face learning will definitely get them um, prepared for distance learning. And I can tell you that my students, <laughs> my upper level students, they were ready to rock and roll. They could, they did very well. It was more the, the Chromebooks that limited their ability to do, um, continue in some of their class projects. We had to change pace a little bit. It also reduces paper and toner and ink costs. And if you're having to purchase those with your 412 money, um, that gets really expensive. My new printer, um, each cartridge will print 28,000 sheets of paper. So if you have to buy one set of toner cartridges every year, it's roughly $1,600. So as long as you're not having to buy that all the time and using all of your 412 money in toner, by all means, use that LMS, save the money where you can. So um, some of your options, now some of your districts may have adopted a learning management system during COVID. Some of them may have just said, hey, use, use what you want. Um, you can use CTU, you can use Moodle. I've used Edmodo in the past. I really liked it. Um, but my school switched to Google Classroom. And so I switched as well. And I do really like Google Classroom. There's a couple of things I wish that was a little bit better, um, but overall it's been a mostly pleasant experience. Uh, Canvas.learn was from MIT, Schoolology, and there are several others. Um, if you have the option to choose your own LMS, I would suggest go review them. Um, see which one is going to best meet your needs and your goals. Some of them have smartphone apps and some of them limit the options for like the number of classes that you can create, the file sizes that you can upload, the number of students you can have in a class. Just make sure that you are reviewing those. And like I said, it meets your needs. So managing all of it at the same time, we've been talking a lot about different little parts, but Create a system that works for you. Get organized in a way that works for you. Become allies with certain people in your district. Your school secretary, I tell you what, your school secretary can help you out so much when you need it. They are the first person to deal with irate parents, you know, during that, that phone call. Uh, that's your first line of defense. They can either calm that parent down or they can give you a warning so that you know how to handle it um, and you're not taken completely off guard. Your janitor, you guys, computer rooms create a lot of dust. Um, I have a computer lab and then I also have a project lab. Um, and my janitor unfortunately retired this past year, but she was really great in helping me make sure that, um, you know, my classroom was swept before parent-teacher conferences were face-to-face -face and um, certain things got done. She'd help me check on some stuff if it was a crazy busy day. And your district IT director, they can help you get some really great discounts on equipment and supplies. 
They can also help you be an advocate for your program with the rest of school administration. So if you have outdated computers or you need some upgrades, they can, they can really help you out. Uh, and it can be, you know, they talk to the superintendent regularly or they may have to present to the school board regularly. Um, they may hear about some other additional major funding options or things like that. Make sure that you become allies with them as well. So your career tech student organization is BPA and it is vital to a successful BMIT program. And your program, your BMIT program being strong and successful is also crucial to your student success in BPA. You need to know what it is, know how it benefits your students, be able to explain it to your students at the beginning of the school year, have a page about it in your handbook. I do. I let the kids know uh, what it is. I've listed out a list of all the activities that we've done over the years, you know, and that we're looking forward to new activities and, and exciting opportunities for our students. And make sure you keep your hardcore BPA students active in the organization. If you inherited a program last year, you probably kind of have an idea in mind of who those students are. If you're coming into a new program, um, you know, do an all call. Hey, if you were a member of BPA last year, come talk to me. I would like to get to know you. Um, maybe do a pizza lunch with them or something like that. Get to know those kids because they are going to be the driving force of excitement uh, with your program. I had that with a student. Um, my officer team, when I first started, they were like, okay, we're really worried. You know, if there, we've had a lot of crazy stuff going on and this was a group of juniors who had, you know, I was their third teacher. They'd had a different teacher pretty much every year that they had been in high school. And it was their excitement. They helped me as much as I helped them. And so that's, you know, get to know those kids. Fundraise. I hate to tell you this, but active chapters are very expensive to operate. Um, you're going to need to start fundraising very early in the school year with approval of your school, of course. If you um, go talk to your finance people, your encumbrance clerk, if my school district has a sheet, uh, level one, two, and three fundraisers that we have to turn in in April of the spring semester. If your school district does something similar, go talk to them and see if you can get a copy of it, see what the previous teacher had submitted. Um, in my district, if you need to make any changes to that or additions to it, it has to be approved by the school board first. So you can't do anything just kind of spur of the moment unless it's a what we call level two fundraisers are fundraisers that are just within the school. So maybe we do Santagrams at Christmas, you know, um, you get a candy cane for a dollar, you get a candy cane and a love note from somebody. Um, raises a few dollars here and there. Uh, those we wouldn't, if it's long as it's inside the school, um, we would be okay if we had to go, you know, out in the community to do something that's not donation based, would have to require some extensive early planning. Take students to serious and fun activities. Take them to the leadership conferences. Get them involved. Make them go to things. Give them tasks like, hey, you need to remember um, who your speaker was, what sessions you went to, because that works for your torch awards. Uh, for competitions, get, encourage them to, to compete. And if you've got a student that you would really like for them to compete and they're like, eh, I don't know. Evaluate what you know that student's strengths are and say, hey, you're really good at desktop publishing. Like you have an eye for this. I think you should do the desktop publishing competition at BPA. You know, have a little sheet printed out. Talk to them. It works nine times out of 10, it works. So you can get those kids to get them to compete. Special Olympics and Pro Sports Career Day. So our um, partner organization at the national level is Special Olympics. We have had Special Olympics teams at my school in the past. We didn't for the last couple of years, but we have a new um, special education teacher coming in who is gonna bring Special Olympics back. And we did unified bowling 
and unified volleyball. That was so much fun. Um, and that is a great way to get your VPA members uh, active in their school and in the community. If you live in an area um, that maybe hosts a Special Olympics regional games, have your students go volunteer to be you know, unified partners in case someone's partner didn't show up or um, to help with awards or just getting things organized. That's a great way to partner as well. Um, Pro Sports Career Day with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, students can purchase the ticket to the game and you get a ticket to the game and for that price, you get a ticket to the game as well as um, the leadership workshops. You can see kind of the inner workings of how, how pro sports works. And we actually had a, one of our speakers one time said, you know what, I'm five foot six and I can still have a career in pro sports. He's like, I think this is awesome. And he was the guy that when Kevin Durant was still with the team, he was Kevin's um, partner when they would go around Oklahoma City and do like little basketball camps. He helped Kevin organize those events and, and coach them and things like that. And Day at the Capitol is an event where um, your student organization can go to the Capitol, meet with legislators and legislative um, legislators and watch legislative sessions. Um, that's kind of taken a different look over the last couple of years and during due to COVID and also capital closures. Okay, ACTE hasn't hosted that um, or organized that for the last three years. So we'll just have to kind of wait and see if that's going to be an option this next year, um, what the COVID and, and construction situation looks like. And then offer incentives and recognition for dedication and success in BPA, um, such as honor cords. I offer honor cords to my graduating seniors who have been active, actively involved for at least two years, including their senior year. Um, if you're not, a, if you were in freshman and sophomore year and you quit, I'm sorry, you're not going to get a court. You've got to be active for at least two years, including your senior year. If you're an active member, you get a double cord that's red and blue. If you're an active member who served as an officer or placed at state, you get a tri cord that is red, blue, and gold. Um, I've also taken students to nationals three times. We went to Anaheim, uh, Boston, and Dallas. And they have loved that. And those trips, like I said, they are expensive. So you're going to want to fundraise and um, help get those kids there. Officer elections. We try to have officer elections in the spring semester um, because of COVID and, and some things that happened during the spring semester this past year at my school. We're going to have officer elections this fall. Um, if you have an officer team in place right now, go ahead and have that officer meeting during the summer. You know, try to meet with them before school starts and get your program of work out of the way. Um, get some of those things planned as soon as you know the BPA calendar um, and your career tech calendar for the year. Community relations. You can't build community support for your organization if the community doesn't know what it is or know anything about it. Submit those articles to your local newspaper. Uh, especially if you're in a rural area, definitely get those out. My, my local newspaper loves it when people write articles for her. She's pretty much a two-person show. You know, in Oklahoma, everybody knows what FFA is. BPA, they have no clue. Like, what is that? So be prepared to explain what BPA is a number of times. Um, my National Leadership Conference supporters I educated them on what BPA is, and now they love the organization, and they have bent over backwards to help us. So we fundraise, 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 uh, but we have an organization in the community. Um, it's called the Chelsea Economic Development Authority, and they get a lot of money from a lot of different sources, and then they reinvest in the community. So what they have done is we've submitted proposals to them in the past, and you say, hey, we've raised, you know, it's going to cost us, seven, for example, $7,000 to go to nationals by the time we pay for the kids' flights, a hotel stay, their meals, parking, you know, the school is going to pay for this. They're covering parking, they're covering transportation, this stuff, this is what the school is going to cover. We have fundraised X amount of dollars, 
you know, we're short $1,500. Um, we are asking you for your support and they have never said no. And each time they have actually given us additional money and said, Hey, take these kids out to a nice restaurant, show these kids what Boston is all about. Show them what Anaheim is about. It's a trip of a lifetime. Stop at a museum on the way. Um, you know, for example, when we went to California, we drove, it was a two day drive. We went to the Grand Canyon. Um, we went to Hoover Dam. Um, they told us to take the kids to, you know, Universal Studios, Hollywood. Uh, when we went to Boston, uh, we got the one Boston card. We ended up at a Red Sox game. We um, went up to Salem and toured the Salem Witch Museum. We went to Nathaniel Hawthorne's house. I mean, we went all over. We went to um, several museums, Dallas. We went to the Perot Museum. Um, went to the um, President Bush's library at SMU, President George W. Bush's library. We also went to the um, Dealey Plaza and into the museum there. So the kids got a lot of, you know, extra cultural um, and historical experiences along with that. And that also helps when those kids get on their social media and they're posting pictures, that helps draw more kids that next year to your chapter. So make sure that you're doing some fun stuff along with the series to really build your chapter and draw those kids in and keep kids you know, participating. So some classroom projects, um, project-based learning, it's a great way to cover a lot of material in one sweep or even use it as a test for a unit. I do not like multiple choice, true, false essays. I hate those kinds of tests. I prefer to give kids projects because in Photoshop, there's about four or five different ways for each kid to do, you know, for you to do one thing. As long as they can achieve it, that's what I want to see, that they achieve that task. Um, sometimes it can be hard to do in a high school classroom due to a variety level of skills. You may have to extend your lessons a little bit, give them some additional time. You can find projects for free, buy them, create them, whatever it is that you need to do, but make sure that they're relevant and they implement skills that students are going to use in the real world and will also meet your curriculum standards. Consult other content areas to see if there's something that you could help them teach, like formatting research papers, doing timelines for a history class, things like that. Um, my history teachers have loved me because I start my fundamentals of technology out with Word, and they know how to do page numbers. They can help kids who are not in fundamentals of technology as well. So it helps you know, get some peer tutoring in and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it, it just really, it helps a lot. And I use a combination of daily work and some projects. You know, for fundamentals of technology, um, it is a lot of daily work in my program. I use um, BE Publishing is really great for um, some daily work assignments and such. And then projects, my upper, my upper level classes, like my desktop publishing, multimedia, web design, they all do projects. Um, but there is some daily work in there as well when they're doing book work. But though, even the book work, even though they're working on it daily, it's still a project is what they're completing. So they're learning new tasks every day. So some ideas for project-based learning, the Buck Institute for Education, uh, they've got some really great resources and you will have to register, but it is free. And just some of the things they have, they've got project-based teaching rubrics, um, a project design rubric. So if you're designing your own projects, that gives you kind of a really great idea um, for how to create some of those rubrics. And even one that I thought was kind of funny at first, but then I'm like, you know, this is really good, is a rubric for rubrics. You know, how do you create a rubric? So if you're coming into a classroom where you haven't used rubrics before um, to help guide those projects, or if you're not accustomed to a project-based learning environment, knowing how to create a rubric that a student can understand and follow in order to create uh, this project, the end result, that's actually a really good resource. Um, essential project design elements checklist is really good. And then there's, there's just so many more. It's really a great resource. So check that out. 
um, the parent factor. So you're going to find, and I think this is probably maybe too generic, but I feel somewhat safe in saying this from whatever environment that it is that you're teaching in, whether you're going to be in a, um, a suburb, an urban, or a rural school, you're going to find that some parents care, some do not, and some of them will never understand. And it's parent-teacher conferences where you figure out why some kids are the way they are, um, why they behave certain ways, uh, why they do certain things. It just explains so very much. Um, and I have had plenty of students who are embarrassed of their parents. And at some times, it's for very, very good reason. Um, I offer 20 bonus points to students or parents who come to parent-teacher conferences. I have also, if I have a parent who can't work, or I'm sorry, they can't come to parent-teacher conferences because maybe they work the evening shift, something like that. If they send me an email or they want to call me and talk to me about how their student's doing, I still give those 20 bonus points. Additionally, those students who are really embarrassed by their parents, and it's the student who's the adult, not the parents, because they're, you know, they've got to take care of their own stuff. Um, if they come in and talk to me, if they make the time to come talk to me during parent-teacher conferences, and we set out a plan of action, you know, if they're doing great, that's awesome. If they're not doing so hot, uh, we set out a plan of action and they want to come in and they'd want to talk to me. We set forth that plan. I give them the 20 bonus points. I have even had kids who said, hey, would you mind if I come in and work on some makeup work during parent teacher conferences? Like, Absolutely. Come in and do it. Um, I just remember that when a parent comes in, you're going to have to step out for a minute. And the kids that have taken, you know, taken me up on that offer have been doing some good things. You've seen some turnaround in, in some of those kids, which is really, really awesome. Turnaround for the better. Um, Parent-teacher conference communications, those can be a little scary. It's very important to be both positive and honest in your parent-teacher conferences. Even if little Jimmy is the holy terror, unlike any holy terror you've ever had in your classroom, try to find at least one good thing to say about that student uh, before leading into any of the bad stuff. So you know what? He's really great about, you know, following the rules. Um, just the problem is, is he's not turning the assignments in. One thing that has really helped me with parents is asking them their advice on, on, how to handle a situation, especially if their kid's been difficult. You know, I've had a lot of times where parents have went to, you know, the English teacher, the history teacher, the science teacher, the math teacher, and then they come to me because I'm the one that they, that the kids said, hey, go to parent-teacher conferences. I need 20 bonus points in Mrs. Semmerly's class. But when they stopped by the office and they picked up the progress report, they still came to my class and like, you know what? This is the class that little Jimmy's doing the best in please tell me something good. <laughs> I need something good um, because I've been to the other teachers and it hasn't been so great. Um, or I've had some say, yep, this is a trend. Um, or if some, they'll, you know, just say, hey, I need some advice. You know, if they seem to be doing good in other classes, but not in yours, or maybe things are kind of, you know, barely floating along, say, hey, um, this is a situation I'm trying. I've begged, I've pleaded. I'm putting in zeros. What would you suggest? You know, what works for you at home? And I've had parents who'd say, call me. All you need to do is call me and I will be right on it. And I've had some who just shrugged their shoulders and said, I don't have anything that works at home either. So it really kind of brings that, you know, when you're showing that you're trying to make a partnership and you're trying to help the parents out, um, it really helps in that relationship with them as well. And like I said, that program handbook, that signed signature page, that can help too. We also use Remind uh, text messaging. It is a free account. My district uses it as a whole now. Um, it used to be just myself and a couple other teachers that used it to communicate with our student organizations. 
but it is fantastic that if you need to get a hold of a student, but you don't want them to have your phone number, um, they can still message you through that app, which is awesome. And it also keeps a record of the communications that you've had with maybe your organization as a whole or an individual student or a class as a whole and an individual student or even with a parent because parents can join it now too. Um, and it can really cover you in a difficult situation uh, where if it's one of those he said, she said, or she said, she said situations, you want a record of that communication. So your administration, having their support is key to a strong program. And it's also something for you to understand that they are not going to know everything that's necessary for you to run your program. That knowledge is up to you. You are there to educate them on what needs to be done. It's very important to communicate. Um, visit with your principal periodically during your planning period. Visit with your superintendent. Make sure that your superintendent knows, he or she knows what's going on. Because you will have to have, if you end up applying for one of the lottery grants, you are required to have a letter of support from your superintendent. And if they don't know what's going on, if you haven't kept them in the loop, it's going to be impossible for you to get that letter of support. Um, or they may not see it as beneficial. So make sure that you are communicating with them. Um, one also that I like to communicate with is our IT director. Like I said earlier, huge success for your program, um, huge advocate for your program. And remember that you are the advocate for your program. Um, if you are given the opportunity to give presentations to a school board, you know, tell them about your BPA student success. Maybe have your president come in or have the kids who won an award come in. Um, your application for grants, use that time uh, that you're presenting to communicate your program goals and tell them, hey, I'm applying for this grant, keep your fingers crossed, or maybe give them an update afterwards or invite them into your classroom to see how the new technology works. Accompany your school counselor to preview days at your local technology center. Uh, we have, my school feeds into Northeast Tech Prior and Northeast Tech Claremore. So I always, I'm you know, one of the first ones to volunteer and say, yes, I wanna go because then I can, they see me interact with the teacher at Pryor and the teacher at Claremore that my program feeds into, and they feel a little bit more comfortable in applying for the program and asking questions, maybe putting themselves out there um, to do something that otherwise they may not. And then they can ask me questions as well, because a lot of times those preview days, they're kind of short on time so that they can ask me some different you know, questions or I have that direct link then to those teachers. If the kids are wanting to know, then I can shoot an email and answer that question for them. So you can be a resource. Also your school counselor. Um, my school counselor is also our district testing coordinator and she does all of the scheduling. So when she knows what's going on, like how the program of like the sequence of courses, you can work together to make sure kids are getting OLAP credit and then offer other courses as electives, you know, whatever it is, you know, try to form some sort of working, positive working relationship with your counselor or whoever does your enrollment scheduling so that they know, hey, kids have to have fundamentals of technology before they can take multimedia and so on and so forth. And it just kind of keeps everything um, a lot running a lot smoother at that point. So managing your technology, um, upgrading your hardware and software. When you get to that point, for example, when I went into my classroom in 2012, um, we were running some old computers. Half of the computers didn't work. And I had to make some upgrades, both to hardware and to software. And it took a little time. It took a couple of years to do it. Um, but like I said, in forging that relationship with the IT director, I got some things done, some critical things done a lot faster by having that relationship than it could have been. Um, find out what's being used at your local tech center. Remember that you feed into them 
So you want to make sure that you are preparing your students and your students are going to go into those um, programs strong. Just basically what I do is I, I look at it as if each one of my students has the potential of going into one of those computer or business programs. So I'm going to treat getting them prepared equally across the board, whether whether they're not interested or they're going to go to health careers or they're going to go to diesel, whatever it may be, I still get them prepared as if they're going to go into a computer program at the tech center. Those index cards I talked about earlier, student usernames and passwords, that can, like I said, just reiterate, keeps things um, working smoothly. Uh, things can go a lot faster. Your phone charging station and phone prison. This is awesome. I do not allow my students to charge any device using my computers ever. I have pouches that hang on a wall that they can, and there's a power strip underneath of it. They can drop their phone into the pouch. It's numbered by computer. They can plug it in. They have to have their own um, charging heads and charging cords. They leave it there. If they get up and they're trying to look at it or their notifications are going off, I will unplug it and put it in a little canister that I call the phone prison. And I tell them like, it's gonna stay there. Like you couldn't stay away from it. Teaching responsible mobile device usage is super important. They need to know that, you know, being hooked on it, being addicted to that phone is not going to help them in the real world and out in the, out in the workforce. Keep your computers updated, um, reader, whatever it is that you need. Um, know that you know what your permissions and your student permissions are on your classroom equipment. Um, if you have restricted printing, you know, like I said, I offer a paper bonus. Toner deals, never use a refill service. I've, I've had more toner cartridges explode from a refill service uh, than those who, than those that come from factories. So. Um, I actually have a supplier now out of California that is going to supply my toner and my paper, which is awesome. Um, you know, Amazon sometimes has really good deals as well, but, you know, check your online deals for stuff like that. Just my district uses a refill service and it seems like nine times out of 10, they don't work. Um, those, and it's not crisp, clear. It's just not a positive experience in my classroom. And I look at it like if I'm, Teaching desktop publishing, my students should be able to print a quality document out as their final and not have streaks and um, wrong colors and things like that in it. Know about your career tech incentive money. Politely make sure that your school knows that you decide how your incentive money is spent. You make the decisions on the technology that is best for your classroom goals and objectives. I know there are schools out there who say, well, we're using Chromebooks. You're not gonna use anything but Chromebooks. The reality of it is 86% of all jobs in the world require knowledge of Microsoft Office products. 86% of all jobs in the world. Google Docs is not going to prepare those students for 86% of the jobs. Maybe the rest of the district uses Google, but in your classroom, you need to use those Microsoft products if you're teaching fundamentals of technology. Adobe, okay? You're not going to have a student prepared for any of the Adobe exams if you cannot use Adobe. That's what's required by your state department. Um, so make sure that they know that, hey, while the rest of the district is using this in my classroom, this is what we have to use. This is what we're going to use. If they fight you on it, get a hold of Carrie, get a hold of Christy, get a hold of Kathy, get a hold of Mark, whoever your state advise person is, get a hold of those folks because they can help you be an advocate. But it is super important that you are being allowed 
to use the equipment and the software to help you meet your goals and objectives and get kids college, career, and tech center ready. It is your incentive money. Okay? It's not for you to spend on all kinds of personal things unless it's professional development. Um, it is not a shareable fund across the school district. No other teacher and no other activity can spend it and they can't use your purchases. What you purchase with it is for your classroom. And I know sometimes it's very hard to say no, um, but it's one of those things that you're gonna have to say no. Because if you're, you know, the cheer squad wants a giant poster that's six feet long every week, that's your toner, that's your paper, that's your time, that's the wear and tear on your, um, if you have a large format poster printer in your classroom, that's your wear and tear on your machine. Now, if they want to reimburse you, that's a whole nother story. But for free, absolutely not. Um, it is not a shareable fund. And remember that you are the advocate for your program. It's up to you to talk to your mentor teacher, talk to your state staff, um, and educate your principal, your counselor, your superintendent, your school board, educate other teachers in the district as to what your program is about and what you can do and how beneficial your program is to the students in the school. Build that support. Uh, with professional development opportunities, seek those out. Uh, the BMIT division offers a wide variety of professional development opportunities through the year. Take advantage of the CERTIPORT certification each summer. Um, that has been an awesome experience and I am going to be registering to do my Photoshop certification um, here in August. Keep track of your professional development, report it to the district. Some districts keep track, some don't. Mine has been less than awesome about keeping track, but you do need to keep track of it for your five-year evaluation because that will be one of the points that your examination is going to look at. Uh, whoever your examiner, I say examiner, your state staff that reviews your program, um, they're going to look to see that you have actually been participating in professional development. It's also important for your lottery grant application because you will have a, if you do the lottery grant this next year, there will be a form that you're going to have to complete. And then the division will come back and ask you to provide supplemental information. And usually one of those questions on there has something to do with, hey, what professional development opportunities did you participate in during this past year? And make sure, you know, if you're taking college classes, make sure you include that in there as well. It's not just things that you have participated in from the BMIT division. It could be maybe you're going to do, you know, a Google educator um, certification or you're going to do something through Adobe, things like that. Make sure you keep track of all of it. So your advisory committee, um, I'm actually going to be teaching two sessions back to back uh, during summer conference on day two about establishing an advisory committee. So you guys are going to get a little preview of, of some of that information. Um, your advisory committee is a group of individuals who you can consult to make sure that your program is meeting industry needs and also that it's aligning with the program um, curriculum and goals of your feeder, of your sending school. I'm not sending school. You are the sending school of your tech center. So you're a sending school to a technology center. You want to make sure that, you know, if you have word, just for example, you have Microsoft Office 2010 in your classroom, y'all need to upgrade that, okay? There's 2019s out there and it's updating every year now. <laughs> make sure you've got the, make sure you've got the most recent stuff, okay? Um, or at least as close to it as you possibly can. There it is. I hate mm -hmm. to bust in, but it is just, it's time for a break. Um, is this, do you have many more slides? I'm so sorry. Not, not many. I am very close to done. Okay. Um, comprehensive high schools, you guys are required to have one advisory committee meeting each year. The tech centers have two. And if you have the opportunity to join that advisory committee, do it because it will give you so much information on and be very, very helpful and creates that networking, that bond with your tech center. Um, so that you can exchange information and you can align yourself with them. 
strategically choose your committee members, pull in people from the community, the school, knowledgeable parents, um, get your counselor, the middle school computer teacher. Um, I even had a college computer prof a professor who taught microcomputer applications at RSU. Try to have your first meeting roughly October, November. Um, I had local bank officers. I had a school board member who was also a parent who owns an advertising company. Like that was three birds, one stone. It was awesome. She wore three hats. It was so great to have her there. Um, other CTE instructors in your school, I had a couple of those actually sit in on an advisory meeting one time and they really, they provided some interesting insight as well. You can partner with them, um, especially for managing your CTSOs. Like I modeled my officer election process after our F, partially after our FFA officer election process. And then I also team with the FCCLA advisor so that we could have two major fundraisers a year. And we actually went to the school board and got approval for that. Um, standardized testing, just in brief on this one, you're a computer teacher, you have a computer lab, you may lose your classroom, be prepared for that. Whoever your district testing coordinator is, kind of get with them and know what their schedule is and work as something out with them. Um, for survival, ask questions of your state staff and your mentor teacher. You may feel like that you're bombarding them with questions, but it's better to do things correctly the first time than to have to redo it two or three different times. Keep in regular contact with your mentor teacher. Know when your reporting dates are. Um, try not to wait until the last minute to get those done and don't ignore completing those reports. Have a plan to get your certification requirements done for the state staff. Uh, when the dust settles, think about taking some college courses to, to bolster your position, um, also to you know, get your professional development in. And, um, you know, some parting words from Justin Timberlake. <laughs> You'll never make something great if you're afraid to suck or afraid to fail. If it doesn't work the first time, you know, don't be afraid to try again. Maybe you've got a project from earlier in the year that didn't work so great last year, but it's amazing with this group this year. Um, know your students, gauge your students, and you know, things are going to be okay. So this is my contact information. If you would like to shoot me an email, uh, you're welcome to do so. It's msimmerly at chelseadragons.net. I will be around during, oh, let me go back to that real quick. Um, I will be around during summer conference, day one and two. Um, and like I said, if anything you need, please feel free to, you know, if you want to pick my brain about anything, just let me know. Um, shoot me an email. I'm, a, I'm an email away. And for the sample files that Christy is going to have up and available for you, um, these are all on CTU. And this kind of gives you some examples of some things that I've done. If you're like, man, I wonder what that looks like. Um, and if you want to use any of this, feel free, download it, tweak it to what you need. And um, I'm glad to, to let you know. And if there's something that you're wondering about that's not on this list, you know, shoot me an email and I would be glad to, to answer any questions or, or send something to you. And then some useful apps and websites. Scanner Pro for iPhone is awesome. Um, Adobe Scan and other websites, GCF Learn Free was really great, it was super beneficial during um, COVID. I had kids watch a video and then watch one of the videos from GCF Learn Free and then answer some questions. That was really good. And that also kept them on track with the things that we were doing in class. But that's only for certain topics. And any questions? Meredith, will you put your email address in the chat, please? I will. I will. Um, um, her, her presentation will be, um, I will have it in the CTU. I can't even think. In the CTU website in our little classroom. Um, I am going to let you guys go take a break. And if you have questions for Meredith, you, you're welcome to stay and ask your questions, but please feel free to go take a break and be back at 11.05 for Shelly Grant. And I'm going to, once Shelly is finished up here, I'll put a little uh, thing on the screen for you. So thank you for sharing that, Miss Simmerly. You're welcome.
Okay, and you're still sharing your screen. Did you know that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, tend to, I tend to do that. So I'm here if there's anybody that's here and they want to visit. Um, I'm, I can be here for a little bit. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And I'll look at, um, I'll look at the chat here as well. Okay. And see if there's any questions. Meredith. Yes. I have a question and I think somebody did answer a, about the program handbook is I have a, I, I have the school, are you, you're not talking about the school handbook, are you? No, not the school handbook. So the school handbook um, is going to be one that your high school or middle school puts out um, just basically on the policies and procedures of your school um, itself. Your program uh, is going to be puppy? based more on um, the policies and procedures in your classroom. So you may oh, echo free to get home. a lot of the things that's in your, your handbook, you know, uh, hey, for the school puppy. handbook itself. But, um, huh? you know, mine is that we're using a learning management system that we are, um, this is what my grading scale is going to be for this class. Some information about, um, Rules and procedures. Oh gosh, <laughs> I'm trying to think about what all's in it. It's actually uh, I, kind of a long document. Um, you, you clarified. I have one already. I just did okay. want to make sure that it wasn't something different that I needed to, because I'm switching classes. I have that kind of a handbook. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something specific for, you know, be my. So right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I did have a question that got buried earlier. So we're yes. a new chapter altogether. And I mean, awesome. we're kind of starting this out from scratch. Um, how do we get these kids that are active? I mean, we're a rural school. I mean, we've got 80 to 100 kids in the high school, maybe. Um, oh, wow. Um, so what school district are you at? We're Beaver Public Schools. It would be Beaver is the district, I believe. Okay. But we're in between Woodward and Guyman. And... All of our kids are active in FFA, sports, um, vocal band. Yes. We're just starting <laughs> a new home ec uh, career tech program too. Um, how can we get them involved in BPA when a lot of them are going to see it as used to, we get to play games and computers. Now we've got to go do a bunch of stuff and take tests that we never had to see before. How do we sell that? Exactly. Um you know, I, I would say that you're probably first year or two is going to be a little rough. Um, that's kind of a given. Um, I'm right there with you as far as the rural school goes. Uh, we have, oh, with our blended students this past year, we had roughly 120 students walk in the hallway. Typically, we have around 200 to 225. So we're a little bit bigger, but I, I understand when you've got, you're competing against all of the other activities that are going on. Um, start small. Uh, maybe for football homecoming, you do a spirit activity, do penny wars. Um, and that's one of the things that we do. That's one of the things like, of course, this is my second year teaching. I'm on my emergency certification. Okay. Uh, I came from a corporate office in Manhattan. I was born and raised in Beaver running cows. Um, so I'm just getting into this. And I'm figuring some of this stuff out, but I know that Penny Wars and um, dress up days and all that stuff that gets done that are big ideas. Stuco does Penny Wars. Cheerleading does dress up days. Um, right. Football sells t-shirts for booster, the booster club committee right. t-shirts. And that's where it's, it's kind of running down to, well, where can we fit in without cutting everybody else's cinches? Exactly. Um, let's see. Hey, guys. Sales? I'm, I'm so yes, sorry. We're I, out of time. Yes. We <laughs> get to our next session, and I'm so sorry to do that. Oh, too. that's that's completely fine. I was just curious um, on ideas. So. Well, I know. Try some, try some local stuff within your building itself. So maybe it's a food sale, like popcorn, um, candy suckers, yeah. stuff like that. It's- That gives me some ideas anyway. Yeah. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you.
You're Thanks, welcome. Meredith. I so You're welcome. appreciate you. Um, You're welcome, Christy. Enjoy your, your vacation. I will. We're going to be um, starting here in a little bit. We'll be starting our eight hour drive back home. Oh, I don't envy that <laughs> at all. So, <laughs> yes, it's going to keep us busy. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Okay, Miss Shelly, everyone, I want you to meet Shelly Grant. She is one of our fabulous teachers at Oklahoma City Public Schools, John Marshall. Um, Shelly. Hey, you. guys. <laughs> so I assume at this point in time, you guys kind of feel like you've been drinking out of a fire hose. Um, that's how I felt. Um, by day three, I kind of was just deer in the headlights. So um, I've been teaching now for seven years at John Marshall High School. I run the Finance Academy there. And I came from industry. I've heard some of y'all say you've come from industry too. Um, a lot of what you're going to be doing is bringing that knowledge from industry or from other aspects of teaching into the, the business or the business classroom or into the CTE classroom. Um, so I'm just talking about work-based learning today. Um, let me share my screen. And I do more of a, um, if you will, I do more of a conversation versus a presentation. Um, I'm done presenting. I'm not in the business world anymore. So I kind of just would prefer to have a conversation. So feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, but to kind of talk about what is work-based learning because um, there's various different opinions or thoughts on it. it to define it, it would be um, an educational approach and instructional methodology. Um, basically, it's where you use the workplace or real work to provide students with knowledge and skills. Um, you're gonna obviously help. So obviously you can read the slide, but it, it's where you're helping them learn. Um, I don't know about you guys, I am a hands-on type of learner. I can, I have taught myself to read a book and learn. Um, much of our educational process is reading and regurgitating what we have learned, um, but not everybody learns that way. And so work-based learning really helps them get a feel for what they like. It helps them be motivated. Um, it helps them, get excited about learning and, and doing things versus just read, test, okay, next chapter. Read, test, okay, next chapter. Um, so it also helps them gain relevant work skills. Um, one of the things that I like to, to tell them when we're in class and I teach high school, ninth to 12th grade, and I tell them my job is not to sit here and tell you, this is what you need to do to go to college. My job is to either get you ready for the business world or ready for college. Whichever path you choose, I'm here to help you in that path, okay? Because um, right now, trades, we need trades more than we need college grads, to be honest with you. And so work-based learning helps them find out what they're interested in. You know, if they like to work with their hands, that's the path they need to go. Um, my goal is with work-based learning is that they're not me, who at 43 years old decided she was tired of being in the business world and the sales and wanted to be a teacher and should have been a teacher from the get-go. It also gives them experiences to put on a resume, to talk about in an interview. Um, learn by doing. You guys, some of you guys tell me, when, when you hear work-based learning, what do you think? That's actually what I'm trying to incorporate for my classes um, because okay. we were always brought up, go through these instructions and by the time you're done, here's all the stuff that you learned how to use. And in all actuality, you learned how to follow directions. You learned uh, how to and, read and yeah, you didn't, repeat you didn't learn for a how test. to use yes. Microsoft Word. You just learned how to follow these directions and yep. come out. And if your picture doesn't look exactly like 
there yep. and you missed an instruction somewhere. Oh, so yeah. That's oh, what yeah. I try to do as far as show them how to use stuff based on those step by step instructions and then gave them a project and said, use what you learned to write me a report using this data set. And I'd pull a data set off of yep. Apple revenue and Google revenue and just give them all that data and make them create charts and write me a report. Why is Apple doing so much better than whatever? Um, and even doing that, your students are going to go different directions to potentially get to the same resolution because one may go down this path and one may go down this path to get to the same resolution or the same determination of why Apple's doing so good. Right. Um, and it's just how it, it's building those abilities to think critically. It's building those abilities to problem yeah, that solve. Was, that was my main goal. And I even, I had a little bit of pushback because of the way I was doing that because it, I wasn't following the textbook word for word is how it read. Um, so I was kind of fighting that a little bit, but I was at a corporate office and so just a little bit of background to make this make sense. I grew up on a ranch in Beaver, Oklahoma. I got my computer engineering tech degree at Southwestern. Mm -hmm. And then I started into, I was a professional rodeo athlete for three years or well, for five years, including the years that I was in college. There you go. Uh, so I was riding bucking horses and trying to make the NFR and then broke my leg and had no income. So I had to find a way to do that. And my wife was going to school at Manhattan. Um, so I went up there and got a job in a corporate office in Manhattan. And yep. I was a payroll clerk. Oh, you worker. have tons to talk about then. Yeah, I was payroll clerk and I was helping with HR. And within one year, I was the head of payroll and HR at that company. The lady that was above mm -hmm. me relocated to New York. So they put me in charge. And then yeah. it was just like, I had to figure out the new system. I had to figure out all these different reports and stuff. And it was yeah. all stuff that nobody else knew about. So if so, I can teach that to a student, yes, then they can go out that. there with a high school diploma, get a job, and they can be making enough money to yeah. keep them happy doing something that they can feel good about. So let's talk about ways of incorporating just what you said, learning how to do that. Um, and I've got some up on the screen, but you can think outside of the box as well. Um, they can volunteer places, okay? You can do field trips. Um, is anybody here with Oklahoma City Public Schools? Yes. Okay. So those of you with Oklahoma City Public Schools, the reason I mentioned that, that's who I'm with. If you haven't yet met, you will meet DJ, and she will send out emails saying, hey, we've got an opportunity for this field trip. Take advantage of those because that's something you don't have to go and dig out yourself. Um, and it gives you an opportunity for the students to get out in the field and see things. Um, you can do volunteering, for example, the Pride Parade. Um, I've had students go out and volunteer at that. You can do workplace tours. Um, and it, this depends on like, you said you came from the rodeo area. You may have students that are interested in that business world. I come from background of Dell and at and I've still got contacts at Dell and at and I'm utilizing those contacts. I call up at and and we go take a tour of the call center. Uh, called up Dell. We went and take a tour of Dell. So I'm now exposing my students to those different things. You know, at and is a call center environment. Dell is more of a sales environment. And so they're getting to experience this and get, get to see it. Now, granted, they're not sitting down on a computer taking calls, but they're getting to do something other than read about it in a book. Um, simulated work experiences. And I know you guys have been... Um, like I said earlier, drinking from a water hose, so um, our fire hose. So I'm not gonna throw all this at you in a PowerPoint, um, but I will provide you with links um, after I'm done. And junior achievement is a huge proponent of simulated work experiences. They have a um, junior achievement finance park. Has anyone heard of that one yet? 
No? Okay. I, I encourage all of you to utilize this one. Um, it's junior achievement. They have a finance park. They also have an investor challenge. Those are just two of their many opportunities. Um, they also have the ability where you can sign up to have someone come out and talk about career success and other things to your students. So let's talk about career success. Um, they come out and tell you how to do an interview, how to dress for an interview, how to problem solve, how to work with um, you know, other people to problem solve. Additionally, they have Finance Park where you can take a field trip to their location. They set you up with this little iPad. This is who you are. You're a student struggling to make it. You're a doctor and you have to go around and you have to do pick your insurance, pick your home, pick your car and transportation, your cell phone plan. Um, are you gonna have a pet? If you have a pet, you need to add in the food and the maintenance of the pet. Um, so, and it's interesting because then you get over to an area where you're starting to check off, you've added everything up. So you, wait a second, now I gotta pay my school loans. Um, all of a sudden that 50,000 a year is not enough to have that big fancy car. Maybe I need to go back to that commuter car. So they either decide if they need to go redo things or if they need a second job. So it's, it's reality. It's life after high school. It's, you know, what we have all learned the hard way. And then investor challenge, you get to play the stock market for a day. For those of you that are interested in that, um, you literally follow the stocks and play the stock market for a day. And they have have it set up where it's like you're at, um, you know, the trade center, and you run up and tell somebody sell this or and buy this. And it's a lot of fun. The kids really enjoy it, and it is simulated experiences. Um, on the flip side, go ahead, somebody popped in. Oh, on the flip side of that, there's internships. Um, every year, my students go through an internship. Oh, somebody popped up in chat. And um, can Finance Park, whoops, saw it, sorry. Can Finance Park be done with an FAT class or is this finance class only? It can be done with any. There's no limit on, on this. Yes, the presentation will be available online as well. So there's no limit on Finance Park. Junior Achievement works with any of our CTE classes, um, not just Finance Academy. So job shadowing you can do with any. Um, you can, for those of you that have come from business, reach out to those contacts. Um, and guys, don't get in the tunnel, and gals, don't get in the tunnel where you teach business, so everything you have to do is just business. I have some students that they're in my finance academy, but because they wanted to learn about finance, but that's not what they wanted to be when they grew up, per se, and so I helped them, I helped connect them with construction or an apprenticeship for electrical engineering. Um, if you, you know, you've got the network ability to do all of that. You can do job shadowing, career mentorship, um, career related competitions. That will help transition into your BPA question that you had a moment ago about how do you get them excited about these BPA tests? You know, you can come up with some career related competitions. Um, if you do a thing where you sell Popcorn, team them up. Who sells the most popcorn? What was their sales strategy? Um, informational interviews is another option. You can do service learning. Some of these students have to work. So do some service learning with that and get a feedback form, which I can also include, and have their um, direct supervisor fill that out and then you can help them with soft skills or anything that they're missing uh, volunteer hours workplace tours are huge field trips are huge 
Uh, the food bank will take any one of you and as many kids as you can bring. Um, it's the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma. They will absolutely, they crank the music up, we dance and pack boxes. Student-led enterprises, um, for those of you, they do Oklahoma Women in Technology. I also have contacts for the making of men, which teach men how to represent themselves well, how to dress for success and things of that nature. All of these are ways that you can learn by doing. Any questions, any comments or concerns on this? Sleeping doesn't count. The biggest thing on learn by doing is get out of the box. Quit thinking, um, read, regurgitate, repeat, because not everybody learns that way. Even if it's just a matter of you have them do a project in the classroom, um, but you can also have them get out of the classroom and do things that way as well. Your opportunities outside of, of the school, use your local businesses. I'll get to that in a moment, yes, I have. Um, use your local businesses, use your local community members and think outside of the box if you can, offer resources to the community. And let me kind of talk about that. Um, yes, I am a finance academy. Um, one of the things that my students do every year is called VITA. It's a voluntary income tax assistance. We go through training in December, January, for through the IRS and they go through the training and are certified to complete basic income tax returns, okay? They volunteer their time. I feed them in exchange, which of course my advisory board takes care of for me. And they stay one night a week after school from 4.30 to 7.30 and we do tax returns for the community. Now, last year was a little bit off, but the year prior, we did 287 tax returns for our local community. These are just basic returns. These kids, I didn't know how to do a tax return when I graduated high school. These kids are learning something and getting an experience. I have one young man that while he's in college will be working during the tax season for a company that does tax returns based off his experience, okay? Um, when we talked also about the internships, I've worked with Tinker Federal Credit Union and Bank First to do some job shadowing. That job shadowing then turned into, well, they can do a little bit of this. So now it's an internship. One of them is a paid internship. One of them is not. So there's a lot of opportunities there. You just kind of have to think about it and, and how can you make that work? Um, start a school business to fix a problem or a concern in the school. Um, when I was teaching 